Well, good evening from Miami in Florida, where I've just finished a remarkable interview with tennis icon Martina Navratilova about her double cancer diagnosis. So I was in a total panic for three days, thinking I, I may not see next Christmas. Throat cancer and breast cancer. Who has two cancers at the same right. time? I was never an underachiever, but this is getting ridiculous. We sat down just days after she completed her final course of chemotherapy. She got that bell, which said that it's all over, at least for now. To go through it and then to watch it back and to feel that, and I can see. Yeah. You know, so when, when you're going through it, you, you have tears of feeling sorry for yourself. This tear was just happiness. And she talked about the remarkable support she's had from the tennis community, especially Chris Evert, who herself battled cancer. You were both treated in the same place? can't make it up. You just can't make it up. Yeah. So you're a great rival. The parallels are unbelievable. And at the end, I was joined by her beautiful wife, Julia. Would you say all those same things about Julia? Or? Julia, <laughs> it took me a little bit. I'm housebroken. <laughs> and the two of them talked about their new plans for the future. Ooh. What do you think of that? Why not? Scuba diving? Why scuba diving? <laughs> no, no scuba diving. I'm scared of sharks. And the plans that they've had to leave behind. We were waiting for Funkel to welcome a child home, and then we were fighting to cancers. So here is my world-exclusive interview with Martina Navratilova. As she said, she's one hell of a fighter. Martina, mm. it's great to see you. Nice to see you. How yes. are you? Uh, well, you know what makes, what chemo does to you is uh, you feel so horrible that after you start recovering, you, you feel better every single day, but you still feel like crap. So that's when you realize how many levels of crap there are <laughs> until you start feeling semi-normal. So I'm semi-normal now, but the leftovers are still there. It's been, I mean, a very unpleasant mm. experience for you. It's not your first time that you've had to go through a battle with cancer. How has it been different if it has this time? Well, uh, so the first time it happened was 13 years ago, and it was DCIS, Ductal Carcinoma Institute, which means it could turn into cancer, but it's kind of pre-cancer situation, but you still have to do the radiation, et cetera. So it was a shock to the system, but compared to when I got this diagnosis, that was a piece of cake. That was like not a non-issue because this one, uh, at first, when the doctor told me uh, that I had cancer, squamous cell, squamous cell carcinoma uh, in the throat, and then he says, and by the way, we don't know where it's coming from. We need to find out it could be the lungs or the liver or the kidneys. End of story. So I'm th this is Friday afternoon when I got the news. Had you gone in for a routine check? Or uh, no, no, no. So have we found it uh, when uh, I had, um, uh, I noticed that my left lymph node was enlarged and I thought it was from a uh, shingles shot that I just had vaccine like a week before. And I thought it was maybe from that, but then a couple of weeks when it didn't go down, I called the doctor and he ordered a biopsy. And were um, you feeling, after a couple of weeks, were you feeling a sense of foreboding about it, that it wasn't uh, going down? Well, I, sense of foreboding, when I asked the doctor, what do you think the chances are? He says, about 50-50. I'm like, mm, I don't like those odds. Mm. So that's when I thought, because the lymph nodes don't get swelled up for no reason. Um, and uh, that, so I didn't have a good feeling about it at that point. So I'm thinking it could be the brain, it could mm. be the pancreas. Uh, Labor is not a good thing either, neither is the lungs. So I was in a total panic for three days thinking I, I may not see next Christmas. Wow. And that's, so that's I had a... three horrible nights. I'm like, he needed to find out. So Monday, mm. Monday morning I'd speak to an oncologist and he says, oh, it's for sure coming from, from the throat. And it's P16, which is extremely treatable and 95% you know, full recovery. So whew, big, big relief. But, you know, so emotionally it, it's been up and down because, uh, because of what the doctor initially told me. The, the, the initial, when you first had the tests, yeah. what was the first cancer detected? The breast cancer or throat cancer? No, the throat cancer. And was the first thing it detected? Yeah, so what they do... They know it's cancer, they know it's in the throat, but they don't know where. So then you do a PET scan mm. and, uh, and where you don't eat. Uh, and then they give you glucose and then the cancer sucks the glucose. So that's where mm. they know where the cancer is. So that's when they see exactly where it is in the throat. And my right breast lit up as well. <laughs> so literally, literally. Well, the the cancer lights up. It's it goes it goes red. And this um, was the other breast to the one that you yeah, you the had. The first, first one was on the left, uh, lumpectomy, and took out some lymph nodes. And the right one uh, is different cancer, uh, similar area, 
Uh, but this was a real, actual real tumor that was about seven, eight millimeters. So they caught it so early that they did not see it on the, uh, on, on the mammogram, which I just had. I mean, you're a, so. you're a famously tough athlete. Mm. You, know, you don't get to win 59 Grand Slam titles without being a tough cookie. And you'd been through a, a, an earlier bout of, of cancer. Yeah. But even for you, with your mentality, mm. to be told you've got throat cancer, and breast cancer, and it's in the other breast to the one that you had treated last time. Yeah. That is a massive moment in yeah, your life it, to deal it, with. It was because, uh, again, very up and down, right? So I find out it's uh, the throat cancer, I think I could be dying, but I find out, no, it's very treatable. Then they found the right, right breast, uh, and when I had the, uh, the biopsy on the right breast, the, the doctor was saying, mm, this doesn't look great. Uh, we're, we, we'll, and that's when she said that, I'm like, oh great, I have another cancer. That's when I started crying on the table as she's still poking in there, getting samples out of my boob. I'm like, oh great, I have two cancers at the same time that are not related, I knew that. No uh, connection who, at all. Who does that? Who, who has two cancers at the same right. time? I'm like, I was never an underachiever, but this is getting ridiculous. <laughs> Following in Chris Evers' footsteps, who went through cancer a year before, we yes. ended up being in the same place in New York, Sloan Kettering. I'm like, you were both treated in the same place. You just can't make it up. You just can't. Make, yeah. So we, your great rival. The parallels are unbelievable with the two of That's us. That's extraordinary, it's really. Because she had ovarian cancer at the start of 2022. Right. So you both end up being treated in the same place. Same place, same people, some of the same same nurses that were, you know, giving me uh, cisplatin. She was getting some other chemotherapy drug, but same place, we rang the same bell, and... Uh, That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and you know, I mean, she grew up in Fort Lauderdale, and I lives in Boca, I live in Miami. Uh, we both had a place in Aspen. Of course, the careers are, are always intertwined, and uh, then we follow each other this way. And she, she made a, she was on Saturday Night Live years ago when she retired, and did a skit about how competitive we were. Mm. And I'm like, this is the kind of competition we don't really want. <laughs> but I must say, Chris has been uh, just a stalwart. She has uh, supported me so much through this. As I supported her a year ago, uh, little, little did I know that it was going to be reciprocated in this manner. But uh, she's been great. The moment you know you have both cancers, you say you got very emotional. But mm. is that a moment, you know, people talk about their life flashing before them. You, mm. you, you said the first time this happened to you that because you were so young and so healthy, you were very positive and yeah. came through it. It's probably a bit tougher yeah. when you're in your sure. mid-60s. Exactly. Did you, did you yeah. think, my God, this, this, I mean, this could be it? Yeah, I did. You definitely come face to face with your mortality a lot more when you're 65 than when you're 50 or 55 or whatever I was, 52. So that was, um, and you know, the bucket list comes into mind with all the things that mm. I want to do. And this may sound really shallow, but this came into my mind, it's like, okay, which kick-ass car do I really want to drive <laughs> if I only have like a year? So you were really thinking... That's what I was thinking about, yeah. I you, mean, might, yeah. you might only have a year to live. I, I totally thought that. Uh, when I, again, when I didn't know where it was coming from, that, that's a definite possibility. Mm. Once that oncologist said, no, it's from your throat and it's very treatable, then I'm like, okay, so what do we do? So you get into the, uh, as a tennis player, you, you have to be in that solution. You have to be in game mode. And so that's where I think being a champion athlete comes in pretty handy. One of the I mean, amazing ironies about this, I guess, is that after your first bout with cancer, you then spent the next few years telling women, get checked, yeah. get checked. Because the first time it had been, I think, a four year gap from your last exactly mammogram. Uh, mammogram. Yeah. And so you were determined right. that other women didn't fall into that yeah. trap of being a bit lazy about it. And actually, it probably helped you get action quicker yep. than you may have done. Oh, you're absolutely right. It's probably nothing, but you better find out because if it is something, then you want to catch it as early as possible. So being diligent definitely helps. And as an athlete, when you have an injury, you take care of it right away. You don't wait for it to get better. You tweeted, uh, this double uh -huh. whammy is serious but fixable. Mm. I'm hoping for a favorable outcome. It's going to stink for a while, yep. but I'll fight with all I have got. What were you feeling as you wrote those words? Uh, I, I knew it was going to be hard, but I didn't realize it was going to be as hard as it really was. Uh, you know, I love to eat, as you know. We, mm. had, we had dinner together. I love to eat. And uh, eating was the hardest part of this whole treatment. I lost 15 pounds, not because I wanted to, but because I just couldn't get enough food in, in, my, in, my, in my body. Um, the, the radiation 
the proton therapy uh, affects your throat uh, and, and the mouth, and there's a lot going on, and it started closing. I couldn't even yawn. You, try really? to yawn, you start yawning, and it closes up, and it, it stops the yawn halfway. I couldn't sneeze. It was like because it was so swollen. And I only had three weeks of the proton when the normal course is seven weeks, but thankfully at Sloan Kettering, Dr. Nancy Lee uh, started this program where you only do three, three, three weeks. If, if it resolves, then you stop. If it doesn't, then you do the seven. And you had to wear this extraordinary mask. Yeah. I'm going to bring in exhibit one oh, here. Oh, yeah. Um, so you we have, can yeah, re yeah. reunite you with your mask. I um, call her Lucille. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Come on, Lucille, here we go. <laughs> So, Here is the mask, yeah. So the, it even looks like me. It, so it does look mask, like you, yeah. yeah. So explain what this is and why you had to use this. So you, they, you see all these holes? That's how they mm. tape it. You're laying, you're laying on a table, and even for the, for the back of the head, you have a formed uh, cushion that's yours. Mm. And then and they put this on top, and they, they, fa they, they uh, tape it down with these little pegs. So you literally cannot even open your eyes. Maybe a little bit I could see out of my right eye, but most of the time I couldn't. You just can't move. You cannot move because the proton is so specific, uh, ready to radiate from four different angles. So yeah, this Why is Why did Lucille. you call it Lucille? Oh, so a very good friend of mine had a, had a Harley. I sold her my Harley and she named the Harley Lucille. And she was a really close friend and she died from cancer. So I named, I named Lucille, but Lucille's gonna get smashed. <laughs> I mean, like smash, not drunk, but probably broken smash up. her into a thousand pieces. You learn to hate Lucille. Some really. people make a planter out of him, but I think I'll just smash the heck out of her. <laughs> <laughs> you also had chemotherapy yeah. at the same time. So were they happening concurrently or did you have to yeah. break it up? Yeah, it was at the same time. So chemo was week one, week four, week seven of the proton and proton was every single day for seven weeks. And that was the hard part because the first week is both chemo and radiation mm. at the same time. And when you start feeling lousy, you're not sure if it's from the chemo or the proton. Mm. Proton is much more gradual. Uh, then the effects on the throat are more gradual. So you just hit from all the ends. And I don't think the doctors do a very good job of telling you what, how it's going to really hit the fan. You know, they tell you, well, this could happen or that could happen, but it's all everybody's different, but they don't really get you ready for how bad Have you ever been through be. anything like this? No. So the toughest thing you've had to do? It's definitely the toughest thing I've ever done. Uh, yeah, I mean, it still is hard. I still don't feel great, but I feel better every day. After the break, more from my exclusive interview with Martina Narapolo. How do you feel emotionally? Emotionally, it's been really weird. So the emotional part was more difficult before I started the treatment mm. because I still didn't know if they were going to accept me into the program. When the breast cancer showed up, I didn't know if that was going to disqualify me because I knew the seven weeks was going to be brutal. This was a trial thing that you the were taking The trial public. that's yeah. hopefully three weeks instead of seven. And I knew that would be a massive difference in long term. Not, not mm. Forget the seven weeks you're doing it. It's, when, it, when you do it seven weeks and depending on how big the tumor is, it could affect you the rest of your life. So the biggest stress was getting into the treatment, uh, which finally did happen. So emotionally, very up and down beforehand. Once the treatment started, the harder part was physical, mm. getting through that. And of course that plays on your emotions too. So I did a bit of crying overall, probably maybe a grand total of 15 minutes, mm. but uh, you know, it just kind of hits you and then you're like, okay, you just have to suck it up, and there's always somebody that's worse off than you are, especially when you see kids around there. Well, that's what I was going to ask. I mean, there were children, mm. like young kids around you, yeah. having treatment which may or may not save their lives. Right. What was that like to, to see uh, on a daily basis? Reality check. Reality check. Uh, I mean, you know everybody that's there has cancer. You just don't know which one, so cancer is a... Is, uh, is very uh, democratic, it totally doesn't care who you are. Uh, we're all kind of in the same boat, but different boats because some may, uh, they don't know if they're gonna be cured. I knew my chances were pretty good. But when you see kids, that's when you really stop feeling sorry for yourself because uh, what the parents go through, the kids may not even know what they're going through. That there, there, there were kids that were six, eight months old, toddlers, children, uh, you know, newborns practically and they have to put them to sleep to do the treatment so they don't move. Um, that's when you, like, you, you just don't feel sorry for yourself anymore. Mm. It's okay, you just gotta suck it up and deal with it. You had an amazing moment. This was um, 
a little video of you with the bell being rung to signify the end of your treatment. I'll just let you watch it. People throwing it three times. I did. Yeah. It was hard not to cry, I tell you. I'm crying just looking at it again. Because you wait, you wait, you just can't wait to ring the bell. Um, and uh, yeah, it's still in God's hands, so to speak, whether you're going to be 100% or not. But uh, you hope for the best. Yeah, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> Yeah. So this is the magical and uh, difficult. And thank you, uh, whoever figured out this protocol thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, the people were great. They were really phenomenal. It's, it's, uh, I mean, it was wonderfully moving to watch that yeah. for me. Mm. I, I can't even imagine for you to go through it and then to watch it back and to feel that and I can see. Yeah, because you have, you have, you know, so when, when you're going through the treatments, you have some feeling sorry for yourself, treat, uh, tears. You, they pick, you pick your music, what do you want to listen to? So usually it was Bob Marley, which was great. It was the best music I didn't listen to. One time I picked Elton John <laughs> and then he starts singing, I'm still standing. And I'm like, he, he sang that to me in Paris uh, during the French Open in the 80s. Went to his concert and said, I dedicated this, this song to Martina. I'm still standing because he knew that was one of my favorites. So when they're, you know, I'm, I'm in this freaking mask, uh, not, not able to move, and that song came on. I'm like, oh, great. So I can't really cry because I can't swallow. <laughs> I can't move. Uh, so you've, you've, you have tears of feeling sorry for yourself. This tear was just happiness mm. at the end because you've been waiting for seven damn weeks. And, um, yeah, I mean, the, the work is not finished, but the worst part is behind me. And now I know I will just keep feeling better every day. What have they told you about the prognosis going forward now? Uh, it's very, very good. I mean, as far as they know, I'm cancer free. I still need to do, deal with the right breast. Uh, probably will have radiation, but that's a couple of weeks and it's like, that doesn't mm. even count. And uh, that's more pre pre preventative than anything else. And uh, you know, should be should be good to go. It's like 99% uh, uh, solvable. Um, so I definitely will not be missing any of my checkups. Uh, I'll be very diligent about it. But the prognosis is excellent. Um, but you never know. Just like you, you know, you never know. You mentioned music, and your agent Mary had this yes. wonderful idea of getting a lot of your friends from the tennis world to send a song. Mm -hmm. to rally your spirits and they all sent songs with messages and I want just to go through some of these I found it really moving actually it was amazing um, Chris Everett we talked about yeah. who obviously had just had cancer herself treated I didn't know at the same clinic as you your great rival and she sent you lean on me by yeah. Bill Withers which includes a line I just might have a problem that you'll understand we all need someone to lean on lean on me when you're not strong and I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on. Uh, you're making me cry again. See, I couldn't. It's making I, me feel quite emotional. I couldn't even. I couldn't even read the stuff when Mary first sent it to me. I just started crying, and I'm crying now. God, I'm such a softy. Um, and I, I, I started reading it. I'm like, I cannot listen to the music because I'll definitely be bawling my eyes out. So I just kind of one day at a time. I read a little bit from what everybody wrote because it was so moving. Lindsay Davenport, what she said, Sam Smith, Claire Balding. Uh, Chrissy, well, Claire I Balding mean, sent you something inside so strong yeah. by Lady Safari. Uh, something inside so strong, I know that I can make it. Billie Jean King sent you I Will Survive by Gloria Yeah, Gaynor. thanks a lot for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a happy song. Uh, but yeah, it was yeah, just uh, Pam such Shriver, a... Pam Both Pam. Sides Now by Joni Mitchell, yeah. which had the lyrics, I've looked at life from both sides now, from win and lose and still somehow, it's life's illusions I recall. I really don't know life at all. Yeah. Um, and Sue Barker just, I Believe in You by Il Devo. I, I know. It's like, I mean, it's t total tearjerkers, all of them. And, uh, and then what they said to me personally, uh, outside of the song, mm. was just so meaningful. Um, that I had to like parse it to myself a little bit at a time because it was so overwhelming. And you don't realize how much you mean to people until they mm. do something like that. And you know, that's, that's really special. So the tennis world has been amazing. 
uh, the support that I've gotten. I hear even uh, Jimmy Connors said. Jimmy's called me, actually. Jimmy called me. I mean, me. the greatest um, street fighter in tennis history after yeah, right? you, right? What did he say to you, Jimmy? Um, just that he knew he was that I was gonna kick cancer's butt. See, I got I got my little bracelet here. I got I got my so I bought myself. Julia gave me this one, Cartier. Mm. This one I bought for myself, tough as nails. When I finished treatment, that's what I put it on. And tough then as I, nails. Tough as nails. Mm. And then I have cancer, which is from a friend who um, passed away a couple of years ago. But she was she had a great life. And mm. and Jimmy says, I know you're gonna, you know win this battle so yeah uh, when, when you get that kind of support it's like yeah I'm gonna kick this out did the you actually because of the music choices did you did you play the songs I played them eventually but it took me a while it took me I had what to was do it, it like to, to I mean I especially I mean I don't want to single one out but because of what, <laughs> because of what Chris Everett had been through herself yeah. so recently because you'd been such great rivals because yeah. you had been treated at the same place yeah I just felt her choice of lean on me yeah because you had been right there for her. Yeah. I remember reading your, your tweets to Chris Everett at the time. Yeah. And then suddenly you're in this world of pain, physically, emotionally, everything else, and she's there yeah. saying, lean on me. Well, Chris, Chris gave me this little necklace and uh, I was wearing it for a while. Then I you know, took it off and replaced it. And when Chris got sick, I, I put it back on. I'm like, I'm not gonna take this off until she gets well. So I never took it off. I finally had to take it off to put the mask on. Mm -hmm to get the radiation, I had to take this off. So I finally put it back on again today. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we, you know, when, even when we were rivals, we still depended on each other. We made each other better. And uh, I think we made each other pe better, better humans as well. I mean, that's and an, we were uh, always there for each other, no matter what. That's an amazing thing. I mean, just for me as a, a great tennis fan who watched you guys go at it mm. for all those years, the fact that when it really mattered, actually, it wasn't a sport. This was life and death. Yeah. There you are again. Yeah. But this time united together. Yes. Oh, and I guess we'll we'll go into the sunset together. <laughs> Maybe hopefully mm -hmm. when we're about hundred years old. A lot of tennis players live to be a hundred, so I'm still planning on that, but we'll see. <laughs> but this is a definitely big hiccup. But yeah, if you look at the Hall of Famers or or people that really play mm -hmm. tennis, tennis has been found to be the one sport that prolongs your life more than any other activity. Was there anything so. that, that Chris, I mean, the, the opening line of Lean On Me, I just might have a problem you'll understand. Was there anything in particular, given what she'd just been through, which really helped you? Um, the, well, the mental toughness, of course. Um, I mean, hers was more of a question whether she was gonna be okay. I think mm. hers was more dangerous, uh, uh, solution-wise. And, and also she went, I think she had six sessions of it, was just really beat her up. Where it beat her up so much that she couldn't even reply. And that's, that's when mm. I knew it was really, really tough. And I knew that she, well, what she went through, that, that I could ask her a question, I would get an honest answer. And uh, so we mostly texted, but we also spoke a couple times. And uh, uh, it, it was just so different. If she hadn't gone through it, it would have been a different situation. Did it help you, do you think? It definitely helped. Mm -hmm. uh, every little bit helps. You don't know what puts you on the, over the edge, right? Just, just like you don't know what, when cancer happens, what mm -hmm. makes it click the wrong way. Just like you don't know what makes it click the right way when you, mm -hmm. when you, uh, when you are healing, when you are trying to kill it. Uh, and so every little bit helps, all that positive energy. So it's why it's so essential to surround yourself with people that give you that energy. That when you have these great you champions, you know, Chris, uh, Billy Jean and others, is there something about being a great sporting champion which gives you that little extra reservoir of strength? I mean, you've so often been, you know, trailing in a massive yeah. final at Wimbledon and you've got to somehow dig deeper, perhaps more than most people do. Does that trait help when you're fighting uh, something like that? Absolutely. I, I, I know Chris never gave up playing when she was playing. I mean, mm. Billie Jean, by her own uh, account, had tanked a few matches where she, you know, just said, screw it, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. But Chris and I, I don't, I don't ever recall. I mean, I felt sorry for myself thinking, OK, I'm probably going to lose, but I'm going to keep fighting until the match point is over. Um, and the tennis teaches you that mm -hmm. I think and maybe champions have that more than the you know player ranked 200 or maybe they just can't be any better even though they're giving everything they have mm -hmm. but you definitely have that mentality that I am not quitting until the match point is finished mm -hmm. 
and uh, you, you're always in the solution. So that tennis teaches you that and, and um, that mentality that Chris and I, I, I don't know if you're born with it or if you learn it later, but you definitely, it's a, it becomes a habit. Not you, are you planning a long drunken lunch, you two, to celebrate? <laughs> we, we will definitely celebrate. Right now, I can't alcohol. It tastes terrible. Does it? I haven't had any alcohol for two months during the treatment. I, I quit. I didn't want to, but mm. then the taste buds change. And I tasted a little tequila the other day. Oh, my God. Wine, horrible. It's like the worst vinegar you could Should imagine. Should that all come back? Will you be It able? will come back. It's coming back slowly. But uh, I had never been drunk in my life, but I may get drunk this time around. I don't know. <laughs> this would be a good time to celebrate, I think. I can see but we, we're definitely getting together. I can see a few of you ladies having a long lunch. We might do something, maybe, you know, pot is legal here in Florida, so maybe <laughs> we'll just smoke a joint in honor of Bob Marley uh, and, uh, and not get drunk. Uh, so, but definitely there'll be a lot of laughter What was the Bob and Marley song that you, that you had played? Uh, well, they, they just played all Bob Marley, right. but uh, Could You Be Loved is my favorite, I think, right. yeah. Your father, you said, used to say, if it did, doesn't involve your health, it's not worth poop. It's so yep. true, you said then. This was after your first bout with cancer. Because when I was diagnosed, the whole world stopped for me. Everything else yeah. became irrelevant. Having been through that once, was it more pronounced this time? That, that period you said of three days yeah. where you just didn't know and your mind is spiraling into all sorts yeah. of dark places. Mm -hmm. you know, even for someone like you who's got that mental strength. Yeah. How hard was that? Uh, it, it, was, it was rough. Those three days, uh, <laughs> I can't ever have them back. Uh, those were the hardest three days. All your plans, basically, it's everything stops. Right? Everything stops. Everything stopped 13 years ago, and it really stopped this time around because it was so much more complex. Even when I found out that it wasn't as bad as it could have been, it's still, you know, then, then the second cancer shows up a week later. I'm like, oh, my God, uh, what am I going to do? So, um, yeah, your priorities really do realign completely. And, and, and then if you get through it, then you really, I really only want to be doing things that I want to do uh, rather than things that other people want to do. More after the break from Martina Narapolo. <music> Welcome back to this special edition of Piers Morgan Uncensored from Miami in Florida. What are your number one priorities now? What are the things you think right? Staying healthy, um, taking care of myself, taking care of my wife, taking care of the kids. Well, kids, that's 21 and 17, but, you know, they're still kids. Well, these are your, your two daughters, obviously, yeah. um, Julia's girls, and they're your, you call them your daughters. So well, not, they are. I yeah. mean, I raised them. They were say, six and a half and two and a half when yeah. we got together 15 years ago. So, yeah. Very uh, tough for them, and they're I great. think. For, for and they, 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 were, they were thrown for a loop. Um, yeah. Um, they both said, I don't know how to process this, uh, especially when we weren't really sure exactly what was going on. Um, and Julia was white as white, white as the, these curtains. So when we first found out, she was she was scared. I think she was maybe scared more than I was, mm. um, because it's always harder for the people that survive you, right? Uh, but uh, well, it was terrifying for everyone she, because she, she everyone's was, lives are on hold, right? Very much so. Uh, and once you get in the solution, then you can kind of get on with it. And, and Victoria came uh, twice to be with me uh, during the treatment. Julia was there at the beginning and at the end, middle. I kind of kept to myself and, and and there was one thing that was with me all the time that was Lulu I think we're gonna bring Lulu on before before the end my dog my yeah. little dachshund um, so but it's 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 still a lonely battle but uh, it's important to surround yourself with people that support you and and uh, the family my family was there for me there was a lovely moment that, that Julia decided to surprise you by cutting her hair <laughs> back to the kind of Parisian bob she had when you first met her and she fell in did. love. It's because you'd always idea. said how much you loved that style. Yeah, it's true. And she was planning this whole surprise. She wasn't going to FaceTime you so you saw it. Yeah. She was going to just basically turn up. Yeah. And you see, did she, did she manage to keep it a secret? She did, she did. And she's terrible at keeping secrets. Like <laughs> she, she never buys presents ahead of time because she wants to give them to you like today. She doesn't want to wait till a month from now. So she, she, she kept her bargain and uh, I just, uh, I was like laughing like crazy because uh, it brought back uh, really good memories when we first got together. When did you first see her with the new star? Uh, in, in New York, yeah, when she, came to, when she came to see me the last week of, which was the, the hardest week, was the last chemo. Uh, what the doctors, also the doctors don't tell you is that chemo is cumulative. So Julia was there for me uh, when it was the worst, uh, worst batch, but uh, uh, she looks so cute. She looks younger and she looks 
great. Now, of course, I got my hair cut too because I, though this chemo doesn't make you lose your hair. I was kind of hoping actually that I would lose the hair because usually it grows back thicker. Mm. Chris's hair is thicker. She lost her hair, she had different chemo. Mm. And uh, her hair is really cute, short, but really thick. I'm like, why couldn't, it? so see the competition comes in again. Now Chris has thicker hair than me. I'm kidding. You've been married since 2014. Mm. How important has she been this year for you? Massive, massive. I mean, uh, yeah, Julia didn't do deal with the first cancer that well. Of course, it wasn't as serious, but she was like trying run away from it, running away from it. Um, but uh, this time around, she was there all the way, holding my hand when I needed to be held, and uh, and there physically, uh, and of course emotionally all the times. So. It's a bit of a cliche, but people say these things they can make you actually cause distance between people mm. in the situation, or it can bring you closer together. Yeah. What, what do you feel? It did happened? that. It, bring, it brought us closer together. The first one, there was some distance. Yes. This one brought us closer together. And this is the one that was really much, much tougher, much more mm. severe and uh, serious. And uh, yeah, we're closer, definitely. She said that you were talking about adopting a child mm. because the two girls have now got to the age where they've, yeah. they've left home. You've empty got the nest, empty yeah. nest syndrome. How far did you got with that, and, and has this changed anything? Or uh, I think so. Well, we hired a, a, an agency. Um, uh, Julia was devastated when, when Emma went uh, to live in Europe uh, for the last two years in high school, and uh, the emptiness really hit her. I'm like, go, go. <laughs> Julia's like, no, come back. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I think it was uh, it was a nice thought for a while, but I think this kind of brought it uh, into sharp focus. You know, I'm not the youngest anymore, and I don't want to be the grandma on the uh, on the playground. But uh, for, forget that part. It's just uh, there's just not enough space, I think, for for this to happen. Uh, so we want, we're thinking about adopting, but that's definitely put on hold, and I don't think it's going to happen. Do you know? I I don't. Uh, I think it's just too complicated, and. Uh, I, you know, the energy, you know, you, could, you only have so much uh, right would you now. Be, would you be sad about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, it, was, um, it was a nice idea, a nice thought, nice possibility, but, you know, got to be a little more realistic. So, uh, I mean, Julia will, will support whatever, uh, mm. whatever. I, but, it, yeah, it's just, I think, there's just only so much you can do in your, in your, with your energy, and I don't think it's there for me. You made a, a powerful speech quite recently, actually, talking about cancer. And you were t telling people, we're not here forever. Don't keep things on the back burner. Are you pursuing passion? Cancer dared me to be brave, to be inspirational, to be humbled and to be calm. And that was after your first experience. Mm. What's it daring you to be now, do you think? Obviously changed some big priorities, but yeah. what's it, what do you feel is daring you to be now? Well, I think I'm still, still kind of dealing with the after effects. Like my mouth right now is really dry. I'm still not tasting things. Eating is still really hard. Me who loves to eat, mm. uh, I'm missing all these meals. Great diet plan though. Great <laughs> diet plan. Wouldn't, wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. So I'm still dealing with recovery. Uh, but overall, I think just really seize those days, you know, you're not going to let, you know, you can't ever have them back again. And uh, I don't want to waste, um, I don't want to waste my energy on things that are not productive, that are not meaningful, that don't fill your soul. Mm. And that don't make a difference uh, for not just me, but people around and maybe the world at large as what well. What kind of things are now like, I'm not doing that anymore? Um, things that you guilted into. <laughs> like, like what? Like going to an event, you know, where you have to get all dressed up and it's for some charity or for some person, whatever. Uh, no, you know, uh, I'd, I'd rather go to dinner with four dear friends and have a great mm. meal and have a great exchange of ideas. You said that last time you had a private pity party, but it didn't last mm. very long. Did you have a private pity party this um, time? Well, private, yes. Pity, more like, really? I mean, two cancers at the same time. Again, who massive the hell does work. that? It's a massive so I, I had a pity party, but uh, again, you know, being the, the tennis player that I was, or used to be, or somebody who has been, uh, <laughs> some people said, oh, yeah, but I'm a good husband. <laughs> um, it's uh, getting in a solution. Mm. So you just stay in that. And you have those moments, but again, they're short-lived. Uh, you know, and sometimes it hits me without even thinking. Yesterday I was watching TV uh, and I was, all of a sudden I start crying. 
Like, I really, I really didn't deserve that. You know, what did I do to deserve that? Uh, but again, it, it lasts about... Just a about, random thought you had. Yeah, but it, again, it lasts about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, I'm so lucky because it could have been so much worse. This cancer 20 years ago would have been life-changing. They, 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 they didn't have proton. Mm -hmm. Then they would, the surgery, you, they, they literally like saw your jaw open to get to the throat. Now they do robotic surgery, so it's much, much easier. So I was lucky. With as bad as it was, I still got lucky. I will have full recovery. What's on the Martina bucket list now? Oh, Galapagos. That's been on that for forever. Why are you so keen to go there? Well, it's just to see all that life, all that life. I just want to swim, I want to snorkel, I want to scuba dive and see all these seals and, and tortoises and sharks and you know all these creatures. Uh, team, it's teeming with wildlife. Uh, and I love wildlife. I spent six months in Kenya. I love it there. I want to go back to Kenya again. I really feel at home there. When you were going through the most difficult part of this, did you have that kind of throwback at your life? Did you look at your life? Yeah. And, and what did you feel about your life to that moment? Mm. I could have done more, but I also could have done less. Um, and overall, uh, what a life I've had. Uh, how lucky am I? Any but I'm not planning on leaving in any time soon. No, damn right. Damn, <laughs> damn right. right. But did you have any big regrets when you were thinking, not if really. I've only got a year to live, I wish I'd done that? Or... Uh, well, then I would try to figure out what to pack into it. If, I really, mm. if it was finite, uh, then I would really put the priorities there. Mm. Um, but, you know, I love my work. I can't wait to start working. Uh, I'm, I'm working on the Tennis Channel uh, for the tournament uh, in Miami in the, this next two weeks, mm -hmm. and I can't wait to see everybody. I love my work. I mean, it seems to me, just having known you a little bit, but you've led an extraordinarily successful life, but a very tough one too. I mean, you've had to come through mm. personally and professionally, but personally a lot of big challenges. Yeah. But the, the common theme is you've always come through them. Yeah. Do you feel like at your core is just a fighter? Well, what's the alternative? Giving up, giving mm. in, stopping? That's just not an option for me. So, uh, yeah, you get on with it. I think growing up in a communist country, you're tough. You have to mm. be. And you're kind of stoic because you can't feel sorry for yourself because you would just be crying all the time because you don't have any freedom. Mm. So, um, you know, I, I grabbed that chance when I got it and I was never going to look back. So no regrets. The only regret I have is that I had to do it, mm. that I really, to pursue my dream, uh, which was to play tennis and be free, uh, I had to leave my country. And, and I can't ever have those years back with my family. And I hurt them. Um, so that was tough. But uh, regrets, I, I wish I had gotten a coach earlier. I would have won more. Probably would have stopped sooner as well. So, mm. you know, whatever it is, it's a wash. But uh, um, quitting is just not in my DNA. That, I think, is completely true. Yeah. After the break, we're joined by Martina's wife, Julia. Final part of my interview with Martina, where we're joined by her wife Julia. Well, I've been joined by two more ladies, uh, <laughs> Julia, your lovely wife, and by Lulu. Lulu's definitely your she's, lovely dog. She's always a lady. She yeah. is always a lady. But incredibly she, well behaved. Lulu was with me through every treatment. In fact, I smuggled her to the hospital because I didn't know they allowed dogs. I didn't want to ask in case they say no. So she was contraband. And then uh, during one of those treatments, she poked her nose through the through the doggy bag. And the nurses, oh, what a cute dog. So that's when I knew dogs were okay. Mm. And, um, Do you yeah. think she picked up that you were going through something? Well, she's, she's always following me around. So I, I don't know, not sure, because she's always like attached to my left hip. So but You found it is. very comforting to have Lulu there. It, she is, she is great. She, uh, she doesn't argue and she follows me everywhere. Mm. And uh, she's very well housebroken, so not a problem at all. She can, she can hold her, her <laughs> for would, a long time. Would you say all those same things about Julia? Or? Julia, <laughs> it took me a little bit. I'm housebroken. <laughs> it took me a little bit longer to train Julia, but, yeah. <laughs> but she's very supportive. Uh, amazing, amazing. She's been there for me. Julia, what's it been like for you? Because you've been married since 2014, so nearly 10 years now, and you know these are you know, the love of each other's lives, and suddenly Martina gets hit with a double blow throat cancer and breast cancer. It's obviously hmm. potentially incredibly serious, life-changing, potentially life-ending. What was it like for you? She said that the first time she had a 
from with cancer, you were slightly distant from it. You didn't really want to get... said that. Yeah. <laughs> I was. But this time you went completely the opposite way. Well, when your wife is diagnosed with cancer, and especially two cancers, it puts life in perspective. Mm. And the values and everything, just what seems to be important, suddenly not that important, and the other way around. Um, it changes your perspective and look at life and really makes you think what's 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 important who is the most important person for you in your life and what do they need and of course they need support and um, Martina needed me it was about Martina not about myself the way to comfort her um, make sure she's okay she's all right and do things I usually wouldn't do, you know? Like cook. <laughs> like cook. <laughs> usually I like, cook. You know, like, you know, be like nag less mm. and do things for Martina because I'm so used to Martina doing a lot of things to comfort me. What was the hardest moment for you, this whole thing? I think when Martina just found out that she had cancer, but she had to wait like four days or mm. five days before she knew where and what it was. For me, it was really hard because, you know, like you say to somebody, oh, it's going to be all right, darling, but then you may be lying. Maybe it's not going to be all right, so you mm. don't know. And I am, Martina knows me more like as a, a, a hardcore person. I don't easily cry, mm. but she doesn't know that I do cry like behind <laughs> the closed doors. But for me, it was like really difficult to hold my tears and not show her in mm. her face what I was like really feeling. And, Thinking. There was a look in Julia's face that I never saw before. Because she was scared. Yeah, we were mm. both scared. But um, yeah. yeah, she didn't. Uh, there was, there was a, just a different look and body language that I haven't seen before. Martina said she felt this had actually brought you closer together, this whole experience. Very much so, yes. Mm. The, you know, my empty nesting syndrome disappeared. You know, <laughs> happy girls are gone and having their life and. Mm looking out for each other themselves and, and also for us and we kind of rebonded reconnected and revalue we like revaluation of values happen and importance mm. and what we want to do and what's on the bucket list and where we want so to go on her bucket list is the galapagos islands and kenya i'm sure she said and kenya, kenya. <laughs> i guess that yeah and kenya i mean i'm seeing a kind of maybe a renewal of marriage vows in the galapagos Ooh. what do you think of that why not Scuba diving? Wow, scuba diving? It's a good idea, no, no scuba diving. I'm scared of it's sharks. Scuba. Yeah. Because no. she, she likes snorkel. all the stuff you don't like. And you like snorkel. all the stuff she doesn't like normally. Yeah, right? I'll do a lot for love, but not maybe that. not scuba diving. Mm. So, what do you think? I'm, I'm seeing a scene in the Galapagos with maybe a blue whale in the background. Uh huh. <laughs> no, I mean, I people know. do. Galapagos people... tortoises, but then I, I also have them in, um, in my ranch. You know, so I kind people of... do. They do actually sometimes, these kind of things, they do make people want to renew. Mm. Wedding vows. Do you think it's something you might do? I'm not sure. Because I feel like we're renewing them almost every day. Yeah. In the. But you do you like. Think? But you do like symbolic things. I love symbolic things. No. I'm half it's, Russian. It's a so good idea. It would be months. a good excuse to go to the Galapagos. Exactly. So we have to renew our vows. Exactly. Mm. Maybe next year. But then you're not supposed to tell me that. It's supposed to be a surprise. I'm telling, I love you so much. <laughs> like now, oh. already know. Well, I'm going to go to the Galapagos. So change destination. Hang on, with respect, she proposed to you last time. But she did. At the US Open, on the, <laughs> on the Jumbotron, live on TV. Live right? on TV. I think you owe her one. Yeah, thank you, Pierce. <laughs> I'm there. I've got you back, Martina. <laughs> So then now I have to surprise time. her and yes. do something. Yes. Oh, but now you just spill the beans. How can I surprise well, do it her? We we'll have to think of something We can else. pretend it's a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> can pretend. Martina mm -hmm. was saying, though, that one of the things that probably won't happen now is that you probably won't adopt a, a child as a consequence of all this. Well, life is full of surprises. You don't know ever what's <laughs> happening, right? Like, we were waiting for a phone call to welcome mm. a child home, and then we were fighting two cancers. So... Today, it is not the first thing I'm thinking about because the first thing I'm no, thinking we'll about is for mm. Martina to get well and better and stronger. And we'll see what happens. You know, I personally did not put it on a complete, like, postponed for, mm. like, no, sure. it's not a no for me, but I don't know. I literally don't know. We don't know. It's possible. But not it's likely. Possible. Mm. We don't know. Life is full of surprises. Like, who knows? The one thing that isn't surprising is how tough she is. She's very tough. What's the alternative, though? She's very yeah. tough. Right? 
she's very tough. It's easy to be brave when you have no other option, <laughs> I think. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, that so is that. my view of life, right? If you get hit with a thing like this, you, well, what else are you going to do? Yeah. Roll over? Exactly. But it's still, you know, you got to do it. Yeah. You've got to do it, yes. And I have a completely different perspective of life now because mm. before I would postpone it for tomorrow, for tomorrow, for later, for later, for later. I was like this perfect, you know, Scarlett O'Hara, okay, like tomorrow. Not anymore. I feel young, super mm. young now. You know why? Well, you got a young haircut. Well, that's another story, but <laughs> I, I, feel told the story. Yeah. <laughs> I feel young now because tomorrow I'll be a day older, right? Mm. So that's it. I'm young now and I want to do things that I can and I have energy for. I'm huge, humongous appetite for life. Are you proud of the way she's so come proud. through this? So proud. So proud. I'm amazed how like strong she was during this. Mm. I'm a total hypochondriac. I'm scared of everything mm. and everything, you know. And any medical procedure, anything, I cry. <laughs> needle, and needle. Ah! <laughs> everything. I, I just always imagine the worst. And Martina, she handled it so with such strength and mm. positivity. And I, I literally don't know how she managed to hold it all together. Well, little, what did you think of all the tennis people sending their favorite song to so inspire sweet. her? I think it's so sweet. I did not send the song for Martina. You didn't? <laughs> no. She sings herself. I sing. I wish. I wish. I cannot make a sound. Mm. She's beautiful, but she cannot sing. So, <laughs> but, but when she does, sing. makes me laugh. When I sing. <laughs> It makes you laugh. When did you hear me sing? You never heard me sing. Yeah, well, when, when, when you don't, don't know I'm around. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to intrude oh, into something oh, here. Oh, are you sure it wasn't one of the parrots? Maybe it could have been Pushkin. <laughs> Maybe. I have a parrot and he sings opera. Really? Yes. Wait, Pushkin, yeah. Incredible. What kind of opera? Pavarotti. Uh, Pavarotti, that's his favorite. I would really? put Pavarotti... Or Nessun Dorma? Uh, huh? Nessun Dorma, yeah. Yes. That's exactly what I was Is Lily like going to rock into I Will Survive? Or? <laughs> Lulu is a superstar. Well, listen, I wish you both all the very Thank best. Thank you very much. I know it's been a very long few months, right? Mm. Life, a life-facing few months, but yep, you've yep. come through it's, it. Uh, yes. Pat myself on the back. Thank Aww. you, darling. Mm. It's lovely to talk to you. Thank Great you. to see you looking so well. Thank you. Thank you.